Well, happy Sunday, everybody. Happy March Sunday. Happy March 3rd Sunday. And welcome to our monthly YouTube chat. It happens every third Sunday. Uh, and uh, this Sunday we're going to be, or this, for this chat, doesn't have anything to do with Sunday. It just happens to be on Sunday. This chat is going to be about something that sounds uh, sounds a little bit heady and boring, but it actually, uh, in fact, could be very exciting. And that is the uh, the golden mean in the rule of thirds. Sounds horrible, but it's one is two concepts that are different and yet some way similar. Uh, but so while everybody's coming online, uh, let me just remind you that when we have these chats. Everybody can watch, no matter where you're from or whether you're a subscriber or a not subscriber. Or you can log on to our channel page and watch. But we have it set up so that only uh, members, Studio Insider members, can ask questions. And there's a reason for that. Um, for one thing, when we have it wide open, the questions come in so fast, we can. there's no way we can grab them all. And so one way of uh, slowing down the number of questions that come in and so that it's manageable, we can have a decent little chat together, is to allow just the uh, members to, uh, to ask questions. To be a member, hit the join button and pay uh, $4.99 a month. And you might think, well, I pay that just to ask questions. No, that's just one perk you get for the membership fee. Uh, you also get a free video lesson every month when, uh, for as long as you remember. Uh, and those, those are getting to be really, really popular. We're getting some really f positive feedback from those lessons. And so uh, give it a try. If, if you haven't already become a member, give it a try and see what you think about it. So we've got some folks coming on now. We're getting ready to gear up. So. Uh, I think what we'll do is to go ahead and, and uh, get the intro video going. I go into the um, comparison and uh, well, how they're different and how they're like the rule of th thirds and the um, golden mean. Now here's the deal. I know I've done research online myself, especially where it comes to the golden mean. It's either the information that's there is either not quite right, a little bit misleading, or so elusive that it's not understandable. Not that I'm comparing myself with others, but I am comparing myself with others. I've tried to break this down for you so that it's simplified, so that you can see exactly what creates the golden mean and why is it important. All right, so I'm going to shut up now. Uh, we'll, the video's about, the intro video is about 12 minutes long. Make notes or go ahead and ask your questions, members, in the, uh, in the little chat box there. And then on the other side of the video, we'll get a good discussion going about those two concepts and why they're important to your painting. Okay, are you ready, Roger? Let her roll. The golden mean and the rule of thirds have fascinated artists for centuries, yet a number of people still remain confused about how are they similar and how are they different. Well, they're similar in that both of them are guides for placing and spacing images. In fact, both are just different methods for achieving the same purpose, but they do have some differences. Let's look at the golden mean first. In fact, the golden mean has a number of names. It's also called the golden section, the golden ratio, the divine proportion. And when we do research on the golden mean, we'll find that it really has a number of names that people call it, whereas they all mean the same thing. But as painters, we're concerned with the golden rectangle because the golden rectangle is one of the choices that we have for the flat plane that we use for producing paintings. That painting surface that we choose could be round, could be square, or could be rectangle. Now, if it's a rectangle, there are a number of proportions of rectangles that artists work on. Every rectangle, no matter what its proportion, has within it a square. 
The difference in the golden rectangle is its proportion. It has the exact proportion of 1, which is the square, to 0.618, which is the rest of the rectangle. The thing that makes the golden rectangle so unique is that 0.618 portion can itself be divided into a square and another rectangle that is also 0.618 and that division of those rectangles can continue infinitely. Even though the 0.618 is done mathematically, we don't need mathematics to draw a golden rectangle. All we need is a 45 degree angle or right angle and a drawing compass. Let me show you how we can do that. Now we begin with the knowledge that a square is created with four straight lines and those lines are of equal length to each other. So the first thing we do is we draw four straight lines connected at right angles to each other and that's what I'm doing here. And then once we get those lines connected, we have a square. The next thing we do is to come to the bottom of that square and find the exact middle point, where it's exactly in the middle, right there. Then we take our drawing compass and we go from the middle point to the upper corner, either upper corner, come down at, in an arc, make a mark, just as I did there, and draw a line from the corner of the square to that mark, and we have a golden rectangle. What makes the ratio in that rectangle so fascinating and so mysterious is that we see that same ratio in nature. We see it in the design of plants and the sizes and arrangement of the particles of plants. We see it in the design of seashells. We see it in the design of the human ear, in the way the human face is proportioned, in the way the human body is proportioned. And the Greeks used it to build the Parthenon, to proportion not only the, the actual images, but the spacing of the images that all produce the Parthenon. And did you know that Stradivari used the the proportions of the golden ratio to design his famous and most wonderful violins. In artists throughout history, we know, have used, have used the golden ratio uh, to space their paintings, to place the images in their paintings, not only just within the golden rectangle itself, but within rectangles of other ratios where they've used the principles of the golden ratio in order to create a really pleasing balance and intrigue within the painting itself. But the rule of thirds gives us a little bit more flexibility. We think of the rule of thirds as a grid divided into three rows and three columns. These then are subdivided into nine equal rectangles each a third of a column or a third of a row. So we are dealing in thirds, which is very pleasing, a very pleasing division for any composition. The really neat thing about the rule of thirds format is that you can use the rule of thirds to create your composition on any ratio of rectangular surface that you might want to choose. So if you wanted a really elongated surface, you could create a rule of thirds in elongation and all those proportions will remain the same. You can even use it for a square where you could have all the proportions the same. You can use either the rule of thirds or the golden mean for any size, but for the shape, if you want to change the shape of the format, the rule of thirds is really more friendly for you. We use the rule of thirds in two major ways. We use it to group our composition so that uh, we can have about two-thirds of the larger space that might be in a scene and one-third of a smaller space or in that, in that neighborhood. And we also use it for placing emphasis, areas of emphasis. A lot of people like to call those focal points. But artists have discovered 
that if we play, place an area of emphasis in the intersection of the vertical and horizontal lines in any intersection or in a combination of intersections, that their compositions are much more well balanced and much more pleasing to the eye. Now you'll see that other methods are used too, but we've found those to be tried and proven. Let's take this scene of yellow bird sitting in a tree and show you how we might use the rule of thirds for coming up with maybe not just one, but several possibilities for a composition. First, let's superimpose the rule of thirds over the scene. And we see it's, it's not the best balanced scene. It's not the best way to really present the bird. And we can choose whether we want to put the bird uh, as a relatively small image in the larger landscape. That would work. Or whether we want to do a close-up of the bird. So let, I'll show you several possibilities here where the rule of thirds can really come into play. Now one of those is that we can, if we have the rule of thirds uh, in our, on a transparency and we're able to move it away from our eyes and bring it back towards our eyes, we can then use it sort of as a telephoto lens where we could zoom in on the bird and keep the thirds. Now here would be something that I was talking about earlier where we would use the uh, space, the space of the thirds we might place the bird so that it sits in two-thirds of the space and have one-third on this side, uh, and that would make a really nice little composition that would enhance the bird. If we wanted to show the bird in a larger environment, then we might look at what we could do, uh, how much of that space would we want to show and still give emphasis to the bird. In that case, either the bird would be the area of interest, so we could cross or use the crosshairs or the inter intersection points, the sweet spots. We could allow a larger section of one of those uh, to focus on the bird. Uh, in fact, we could focus on the whole bird with the largest section of those. Maybe have the intersection of the the um, the intersection of the horizontal and vertical going through the bird and then that sort of gives us the same thing it gives us a larger area places the bird in a nice dynamic position now not all the spaces on the rule of thirds is going to work we have to use some common sense now if we did this sort of thing you see well that wouldn't be too bad in fact, that might work really well because we get this strong tree trunk going in this direction and that places a different kind of interpretation. We don't want to sit it in the middle. Uh, the middle is n middle ground with um, when you're working with informal balance such as we're working with here, uh, creates kind of a dull composition. So that's not always the best place to put it. And then uh, another consideration is we don't want something that's turned towards the edge here to be in this in, in this particular side of the third uh, because then there's nothing over here to really balance it out and if we had another bird over here uh, we could do kind of like Andrew Wyeth did in the his painting of the Kerners where we could do that sort of thing uh, where we could have one bird turned in the other direction so there are all kinds of things we can do but we see now we once again we're getting this uh, where the thirds, the two thirds space is being occupied the whole by the whole bird, and if we go in this direction, see we have the same thing. So it ends up in the long run that we're using the rule of thirds more for either the space, incorporating a larger portion of a scene within a space, or for the focal. Now let's just let make that a larger format. And let's pull the face of the bird, or the head of the bird, right into this cross section right here. That pulls our attention, uh, uh, puts place it in a nice balanced place, and incorporates the scene here enough so that um, it, we could create a really pleasing composition with that arrangement. So you can see we could move it around. Let's see what would happen if no that. Perhaps if we. Um, 
perhaps if we pull them, we, we need to keep that thirds relationship because if we don't, we're going to throw it off balance again unless we're using another kind of format or another kind of method for creating our composition. So that's part of why the rule of thirds works uh, is that as long as we're keeping what we're doing within the format of the, the equal division of thirds as we're deciding which one of those methods we want to use, then it's going. We're, we're most likely, if we are careful about the things that we want to watch out for, not place it in the center, and uh, try to avoid having the something turned in this direction, facing too close to the edge without something on this side to balance it. Well, then you see there are when we use it within the perimeters that it's designed to be used. We're going to most likely, most likely come up with a really nice composition. Let's stop here now and let you ask your questions. Let's get a really good discussion going. Okay, now, I hope that it stimulated some questions from some of you. Uh, while, you while you're getting your questions ready, uh, of course, you know to enter them right here in the little chat box. I have a couple of little toys I want to show you uh, because I know when you when you watch something like that where someone's using tools, you'll you'll sort of maybe say, well, I don't have one of those. Well, for the um, for the golden mean, there is a tool available online. It's called the it's called the uh, Fibonacci uh, Fibonacci calipers. Well, it has several names, but also it may be called the golden mean tool. And here's the, this is the old-fashioned version of it. Now, I didn't mention in the uh, video, I didn't mention that the Fibonacci numbers, which you might have heard of, the number sequence of, you might call it perfect proportion numbers, that we find in nature, we find in the universe, we find all kinds of things. Don't want to go quite into that yet, but anyways, the same principle as the golden mean, the same proportion, same ratio as the golden mean. Now this little tool uh, has that ratio built into it so that no matter how you adjust the tool, uh, you have that ratio. So you could use this tool when you're, when you're working on your paintings or even if you're trying to find a composition, but especially if you're working on uh, getting the painting set up for the best uh, proportion, best relationship, spatial relationship, of your images uh, and the space between your images, you can use this tool. Uh, I would imagine that Sargent had something like this and uh, other artists that have used the, uh, used the golden mean proportion, the golden section proportion, whatever you want to call it, when, within their paintings. I would imagine they either had something like this, but you know, we also have a kind of a built-in uh, feeling for that kind of balance. So sometimes artists, after an artist has been uh, working for so long that they've really learned to see those things, you just kind of make it, make that balance, that, that ratio happen automatically. So we have a question to come in here from Terry saying, is it, uh, so is it better to use the rule of thirds? How is it different? Uh, uh, how is it different to use the golden rectangle? Okay, yeah, that's a really good one to start with. Now, if you think about it like this, um, the rule of thirds is excellent for getting your composition because you can apply the rule of thirds wherever you go. You can, even when you're out in plain air, now here's another little fun toy I have, and you can make one of these, if you have a, a transparency, you can make one of these for yourself. Let's see, can you see that? Can you see that really, really good, Roger? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So see, all this is a transparency. It's got a rule of thirds printed on it. Uh, and the, the, this one is the uh, proportion of what we know to be 6 by 8, 9 by 12, 12 by 16, 18 by 24. Those are kind of standard sizes, standard proportions. Don't want to use the word size so much as a proportion size within that same proportion is what those, this is. This one is, uh, is the double size, you know, where we, get, we have those wonderful long canvases that are twice the length of their width. 
put it, put it up. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Roger's giving me a little direction here. There we go. This one is the double proportion. Well, <clears throat> tomorrow I'm going to put this on the website. I'll put a PDF of this on the website, so for you to get free. Uh, don't try to find it today because I won't have time to put it on there today. But tomorrow I will, so that you can get this free, and then you can use a PDF. You can use the PDF uh, uh, to print a transparency. If you have a printer, uh, you can get uh, transparencies that go through a printer and they will print this or maybe take it to some uh, commercial printer and they can print a transparency for you. Or just get yourself a permanent marker of one of those um, Sharpies. <laughs> Sharpie has kind of a funny reputation these days. But anyway, and uh, what you need to do is be sure that you have a proportion here a square that's a proportion of the proportion you're looking for and then be sure that the vertical columns are equally distance and then that the uh, horizontal column uh, horizontal lines are equal distance and you will have yourself a rule of thirds now this is a good way to find the composition like i illustrated to you there in the video the neat thing about it is that you can pull it up closer to your face just like a camera and you have, have kind of a telephoto, telephoto view or you can push it away like that and you're getting opposite effect because I'm pushing it towards you. That gives you more of a wide angle view of me but you see as I pull it closer to me you get more of a close up, a telephoto view and so you, by the way you adjust the distance of this from your, from your uh, eyes uh, then you can find those find the proportions of the placement of the proportions in any uh, in any composition whether you're working a landscape or still life or even whether you're working portraiture this kind of thing is very useful so I think from my viewpoint the rule of thirds is better for finding that initial placement because it's so flexible um, now one thing that you'll find that is the size of your little grid here is going to uh, determine how much you'll have in here. So a larger grid will give you the ability to include more stuff and the smaller grid will kind of limit that. You, you work that out though. It doesn't hurt if you if you have these, if you have these in your kit, it doesn't hurt to have uh, you know sev several maybe sizes so there's one thing to use the rule I use I think the rule of third works best for finding that initial placement and the the um, uh, golden section or the golden mean works better I think for finding that this the space or the distance between images within the composition and so uh, I showed you that how you can see that in the Richard Schmid um, still life that we saw there, how the 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 fruit or the fruit that in the bowls in the still life are placed in that golden ratio proportion. It's a very pleasant placing, uh, and not only that, but the space between. I showed you, and the same thing with the the sergeant, the the little the uh, I've forgotten what it's called now. The, the girl there sitting in that white space of the sergeant. How they, and also the sergeant, uh, the oyster gatherers, uh, how he, he used that golden ratio for placement of, of the grouping of the figures as well as the spacing. So it's a very, it, it really is a very pleasant way to balance the images of your painting to, to use the uh, the golden ratio or the golden mean for the placing. Now you can, a lot of people prefer to paint on the golden uh, rectangle. There's only the golden rectangle proportion. A lot of people just refuse to use any other proportion. I, I think that's a little bit restrictive, but we have all those, uh, we have all those possibilities. And with these tools that are available to us, it makes it really, really uh, makes it workable, workable for us. Whereas, uh, you know, you can d get into this stuff and get into the fear of this stuff and get really bogged down, but you don't have to if you've got the, the tools to do the job for you. Um, let's see, Mary Ellen asked, um, talk a little bit about how to use the tool rules when painting abstracts. Yes. Well, oh yeah, they're especially useful, you know, um, in painting abstracts. In abstract painting, you're dealing with the same compositional principles 
that you're dealing with in realistic painting. The only thing missing in abstracts are the recognizable images. And some abstracts do have, to a degree, images that are somewhat recognizable. So the thing, the, what you're doing with abstracts is, is you have shapes, you have value contrast and color contrast that, that create uh, attention and shapes. And the, so you can use, uh, in fact, you could re use the, real, the rule of thirds for placing the shapes. Uh, uh, you could use the rule of thirds for placing the, you know, the, the emptier spaces with the busier spaces that we have in the abstract painting. Uh, and you can, or you can also use the, uh, the golden ratio, the proportion of the golden ratio for how you uh, divide those spaces, you know, busy, empty, busy, oh, well, you know, there are all kinds of ways we can do abstracts. So uh, maybe that helps a little bit, um, helps you understand a little bit. Yeah, I think the thing is that people don't realize is that there's no difference between the composing process in an abstract painting and realistic painting or any kind of painting. The com it's like music. There in music, there's no difference in the very, very basic principles of how notes and chords and rhythms and all that work together is how you use them that create those different styles. I mean, we've got the, we can, we can get the same, uh, similar kinds of patterns in a rap song that you have in a, in, in a, in a classical piece or so something like a, well, I, I won't go into that, but what I'm trying to say there is the world is not, uh, the, the world of art is not separate. The world of art is unified. It can be unified, but by an overall general universe of principles that make things work artistically. And and so uh, what we do then is we we pick and choose what we we're going to use to make whatever we want to do happen. And the same thing is true here. Um, so Mary Ellen, and let me know, and Terry, let me know if uh, I answered your question sufficiently. Oh, good. Mary Ellen said, yes, it does. Thanks. Good. Uh, Bridget asked, uh, does the golden mean proportion work inside a painting even when the canvas size is not in the golden rectangle proportions? There, uh, uh, That is a square canvas. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. That's the thing that's so beautiful about it is that it doesn't matter what proportion. Now remember, there's a difference between proportion and size. Uh, size is simply how big or how small something is. A proportion, a proportion of the canvas has to do with the, the length versus the width, how much length to how much width. So in a square, we have equal, equal width of, of sides and a top, bottom, left, right, and left, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas in a rectangle, we have a longer, and shorter, two ends shorter, two ends longer, whether it's vertical or horizontal. Uh, and so, yes, uh, it's just, it's the way you arrange the shapes and the textures and things that are getting, getting, a, getting attention. Inside that, you can proportion those, proportion, proportion where you place them, or you can place them according to the proportions that you find uh, are uh, proportions that are the golden rectangle proportions. And if you have one of these neat little tools, it's, it's really easy to do. You can just sort of space things. It's a matter of whether, where things are, how things are spaced, how close together they are versus how far apart they are. It's not just one image here and one image here and another image there, but it's putting or organizing them in such a way that they're spaced according to these shapes. And that can be done in any proportion uh, with, within any proportion of canvas, and beautifully. It can be done beautifully. Look at Mondrian's work. Uh, Mondrian uh, worked especially with the golden ratio, and some of his canvases are square. So check that out. Joni, uh, what is the best size, small or large, when you purchase a, a Fibonacci gauge? Yeah, that's, um, well, it, I would go for the larger one, because, especially if you're going to work on a larger canvas, because you are in some ways limited by the size. Now this old-fashioned one I have here is, what is that, a, maybe about 12, 14 inches, something like that. And you see there, it's got, let's see, get back here and show you, that's about as, that's about as large. Well, if you're work, working on a huge canvas, that might be a problem. So if it were, if it were a giant one and you're working on a huge canvas, 
Uh, you might want one that would be even longer than that, but I would go, well, the smaller ones, the shorter ones, I believe, I've forgotten what the shorter ones, eight inches or something like that, they allow you, they'll come in much closer together for really tiny, tiny works, you know, so if you're working really, really small uh, and, and you're staying within that range, but remember when you when you extend them this way, they're only going to extend, they're going to be limited by the length of the legs here as to how far they extend. So you might just uh, judge or select the size you get according to um, how, how large or small you work. It doesn't hurt to have two sets. I love little toys like that anyway. These are readily available. This, uh, this thing, this, this style is a lot kind of, maybe kind of hard to find out. But these are, are readily available now, I find. Oh, I think there's a guy, on, somebody on Etsy is selling them, uh, making them, doing uh, 3D printing, making them with 3D printers. Uh, and they really look good. They they're the, have the sharper points, which makes them easier or a little bit more refined to work with. So, um, okay, Linda asks, proportions or ratios like 4 to 5, 1 to 2, 3 to 4, but then there are all the canvas size within that, correct? Absolute. Well, uh, proportions are proportions. Uh, the size is not going to change the proportion. So see, a proportion, a three by four proportion uh, can be three inches by four inches, but it also can be six inches times eight inches, or it also can be uh, six, 12 by 60. Oh, don't get me my mathematics going here. But the, it's the proportion is the comparison or the ratio of the width to the length. And the, the size doesn't affect that. All sizes, down to a point, <laughs> all sizes can be uh, different proportions. So you could uh, realistically have, you know, a dozen different sizes of canvases all the way from several feet by several feet to several millimeters by several mil millimeters and they could still all be the same proportion. So that's the reason, I don't want you to confuse proportion with, proportion with size, uh, but I, I think it helps you to use the word ratio with proportion. Well, I don't know, it depends on what, how you understand the terms, I guess. Okay, so uh, Linda, I hope that answered that without confusing you too much. Sue asks, so you can have primary and secondary areas of interest using the golden mean within the canvas so that you, you're you using the rule of thirds. Yes, yes. Remember, the rule of thirds is a way of, of positioning or placing uh, the location of images. But once we uh, find the locations of image, we can fine tune their distance between each other, the, sp the spaces we bring between each other. So you see a negative space right next to a positive space can be a ratio. So if the positive space, for example, let's just go back to my, uh, my uh, Fibonacci tool here. Say if the image occupied the positive space, uh, well then perhaps and if there's some negative space between the, the image here, then perhaps the negative space would work really more beautifully if it were this proportion or ver vice versa, you know. So, I mean, there are all kinds of ways we don't set limitations to it, but uh, we, we, it, it, we, can, we can count on the, uh, we can count on the Fibonacci or the uh, rule of third, oh, da, 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 let me say that again, count on the golden mean, the golden mean ratio uh, for a really good proportion. And then when you place that within the rule of thirds, it's win-win. Uh, I think playing with it helps you to understand it, you know, and, and not making rules out of it, but being flexible. You notice that it, even in the rule, oh, when you're arranging rule of thirds, there can be some, it doesn't have to be tightly contained. It's the general feeling of the placement. Some of the edges can run outside and some of the edges can come some, somewhat inside. Uh, but it's that general overall feeling of the size of things uh, within the rule of thirds and, and also within the placement of things. Uh, for example, when we're using the rule of thirds to place that center of interest uh, according to where those intersections fall, 
that um, uh, we need to be flexible there because the we we humans are, are versatile. We're flexible, and there and so things can be within the vicinity of those magic places and and feel 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 uh, right. Have that uh, um, really balanced or aesthetic relationship. Uh, I guess maybe that's beginning to sound a little bit like. Uh, never mind. <laughs> All right, uh, Bridget. Is that Fibonacci tool the same as you use to transfer proportions from real, real life to the page? Oh no, yeah, no, no, no. This is something different. Uh, you the purport the uh, the tool we're taught that the oh uh, what is the thing called? Compass. No, the red little red tool, um, prospect tool. The prospect tool is a proportion tool, different kind. Yeah, we've got too many tools, don't we? Remember in the prospect tool, let's see if I can, prospect tool crosses over like, kind of like this. It's got two points on one end. I mean, it's got, it's two pieces that cross over like that. And we measure the, sh uh, if we want to uh, transfer a small image of, of, with, of, of a sketch onto a larger image on the canvas, it's, it is a proportion, but it's adjusted so that it's the same proportion on both sides, on both ends. So say if it's about this tall here on, on the one point where the two cross over, and then it, we have it set so that it's three times that on the other end, it's different sizes, but the same proportion. So we're transferring the same proportion with a prospect tool. This is, this, this proportion is one, let's get this right here so you can see it. This is one, two, uh, one, and this is 0.618. One to 0.618. This is not the same proportion. That, that's the golden mean, golden ratio proportion. So this is for, or we, we use it as a guide for, um, placing images so that they have a relationship, they have a, uh, a, an aesthetically pleasing relationship. When you're using the prospect tool, I may have other names too, but when you're using that prospect tool, you're just, you're, you have the same proportion on both ends and you're transferring a one proportion to another. You can do it in reverse too. If you've got a big image, you want to make it smaller, you can do that too. Um, so I hope I made that. Um, okay, Linda says, I hope I made that clear. Let me know if I don't make anything clear. Don't hesitate, because my purpose for these chats is to give clarity. And if, if you don't have clarity when we finish up, I've not done my job right. So, uh, so let me know if I don't make something clear. Uh, Linda says, maybe you can do a quick, a quick tip on using Fibonacci tool. Did we do a quick tip on that already? I don't think so. Don't think so. That's probably a good idea. Uh, probably a good idea, Linda. Uh, if I don't forget, <laughs> it would be a good thing to do to show how that works on a quick tip. Uh, let's see. It. Okay. Um, Mary Ellen says, I'm sorry, but I didn't understand the answer to Bridget's question. Could you explain it again? Oh my goodness. Which one was that? Oh, she, oh, she was asking about, are you talking about Mary Ellen, the Fibonacci tool versus the, uh, the transfer tool, the, uh, Prospect tool. Um, it was just. Uh, it takes it thirty seconds for you to come in, Mary Ellen. Uh, but if you just let me know, is that the one? Is that the answer you're talking about? Yeah, I'll try to explain that again. If if I could find. Uh, let, I think I'm going to get into Roger's pencils over here. Let me see if I can do it this way. Uh, just a moment here. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, throughout, I came out of focus. How did I get? There we go. I'm better. All right. So, the transfer tool that Bridget was asking about. Um, yeah, I really did go out of focus. But anyway, transfer tool, the prospect tool. I did a quick tip on this, but it's a tool for taking a smaller image and enlarging it in its same proportions without changing the proportions of it. Um, it's, it's created, it's two crossbars, 
kind of like these two pins. I'll see if I can do this. And it's created like this. If I had known that question was going to be asked, I would have brought mine with me, but I didn't. It's created like that. It has an adjustment so that you can change it so that one, uh, both ends are the same same distance apart. Let me get this a little bit. Uh, let's see if I can get that just a little bit clearer there. Uh, all right, so you see this distance, this this distance to this distance. That's the way. It's a tool that's connected in the center. So you can, and you can adjust where the center is so that the tool could be smaller on one end, uh, could open up smaller on one end and open up larger on the other uh, at different sizes. So the smaller end, if you want, like it, if you want to enlarge something two times or three times or four times larger than it is in your drawing, you say if you have a drawing, you want, you like your drawing and you want to do a painting of it, then if it, if you have, uh, uh, if you want the painting to say four times larger than your drawing, then you can take the shapes, take the measurement of the shapes on this end, and then this end shows you three or four times that size. So you transfer the size of this over to your canvas with the size of that. Okay. Uh, That's not what she was asking about. She was asking about Bridget's first question. She was asking about Bridget, Bridget's first question, and which was that? That's it lit down. That one, does a golden mean proportion work inside the painting, even when the canvas size is not the golden rectangle? Is that the one? I believe so, yeah. Was that the one? Um, I think, go back to uh, when, when, the, um, when we finish this, it might not hurt if you go back and review the, the video. I was trying to show you in the first video uh, how artists have used the golden proportion spacing things, the way to space relationships of shapes inside the painting. Uh, where regardless of what the proportion of the painting is, no matter if it were a three by five proportion or whether it were a six by 12 proportion, whatever the proportion of the painting is and whether it is horizontal or vertical, the way the space, the sizes of the space ratio, uh, sizes of the spaces within the images and between the images help to create the balance of the painting. So maybe that's what makes it a little bit diff more difficult to understand. So if you go back and look at the Richard Schmid, look at the Richard Schmid um, uh, still life that's in that painting. If you have, uh, you can go onto a Richard Schmid's site and you can check some of his other still life paintings. And then if you take, uh, uh, if you take even just your fingers and measure side by side the groupings he has there. Say, in that particular case, I think it was the grouping of the bowl, uh, and then there's some space, and then uh, so the the side the the proportion of the size of that space next to the bowl is uh, the same as a, a golden proportion. It's the golden mean proportion. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. It's it's the it's the the sizes it's the ratio of the sizes of spaces that you create within your painting surface, regardless of what the shape is on the outside. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm making it more confusing. Let's see. Um, Joni said. Joni says I got the small, but I use it for studies. I got the small. I use Fibonacci. Oh, is this Fibonacci? Oh, oh, okay, yeah. You got the small Fibonacci tool, but you use it for studies. Probably uh, should have gotten the larger, but it'd be a good test. It will be a good test. Who says you can't get larger a little later on? The small ones serve you well, and it will. Um, you'll be able to get some. Uh, you, you know, for working on maybe 18 by 24 or uh, canvas that size. Um, it doesn't matter really to just test it out and see how it works for you. You may find you don't want it at all. You know, you, might, you just may want to do these things by more by intuition than by by spacing or by measurement. And intuition works. Uh, sometimes it doesn't hurt to come behind the intuition and kind of check and fine tune a little bit. 
Um, Joni, I find it so fascinating that nature carries this principle. Yes, nature catches this principle out in so many cases. It blows my mind. That's why it became such a thing with artists, uh, is that the, those proportions were being studied, uh, all kinds of proportions. Like I showed you in the video, even the way our, the proportion of our hands, the, the intersection from the hand to the end of the finger uh, ratio from the bend of the, the wrist to the elbow, all proportions in the human face, the proportions of the way the body's put together, even down to the number of bones in our bodies, there's so many things that have that ratio of two numbers, two numbers that are within, uh, well, within the Fibonacci, 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 I'll say it right in a minute, Fibonacci sequence, which is the golden ratio. Uh, but it's, it's everywhere. It's in the universe. It's the way that they found the arrangements of planets. Uh, Bach used the, uh, used the spacing and rhythm of um, the, t the note tones in a lot of his compositions, as did Chopin in a lot of his preludes. So it's used in music. It's used in math. It's used in science. We find it in, in all kinds of uh, patterns in nature. The spacing spacing that's the key spacing between you look at the rings within uh the rings within a piece of wood a, a tree trunk or it, a lot of times you even even the shapes the sizes uh of a, a, a bark arrangements on a tree uh so it's it it's found in all and and people have used it in a number of ways and combined way the numbers are are combined the way the uh, proportions are combined so it really is a fantastic, uh, it's just a mysterious, they call it the, the divine principle for that reason. It's because it is in nature. It seems to be, uh, it seems to be a basic principle of the creation of the whole universe, uh, which is one reason I think why it's so pleasing to us as humans. It just makes a human feel whole when things are uh, of, a, of a really, um, good proportion, a proportion that feels right. Uh, and it's also it's only <laughs> discussable to a certain extent and then it becomes something that's more of an experience than it is something that you can describe. Okay, oh Mary Ellen says, now I get it, yay! <laughs> Wonderful. The name of the tool, Belinda. The name of which tool? This one? Fibonacci, uh, F-I-B, oh dear, I'm going to spell it wrong. Hang on just a minute. Let me let me double check for the spelling of it because I'm a very poor speller. Uh, F I B O N A C C I Fibonacci. Uh, it was his sequence of numbers that uh, was discovered to be the same as uh, this tool. It's also called uh, the golden the golden mean tool or the golden ratio golden ratio tool. It's called both things. But, um, or when I was growing, I mean, when I was growing up, yeah, when I was first coming along as a student, it was called the Fibonacci Calipers. <laughs> so it's got bunches of names, but uh, uh, maybe that helps clear that up. Let's see, whatever, prospect tool is a transfer tool. Yes. Oh, that is, <laughs> us. yes, you're talking, right, Roger? <laughs> right, that was Roger talking. Yes, that's the tool she wanted to know. Yeah. It's oh, is that it was a prospect tool. She, Sorry. I don't know which one. I'm talking about too many tools now. <laughs> the prospect tool is the transfer tool. That's the one where you're doing exact proportion transfer. The Fibonacci tool is something totally different. And then you have the the drawing compass that I <laughs> that I used in the in the video to show you how to find the proportion, the the golden mean proportion in a rectangle. So yeah. And they all look so much alike. They, they really do look so much alike. But they, then they have their differences. All right, Bridget says, which system do you use when composing a painting? The rule of thirds or the golden mean? Uh, Bridget, when I, when I start, when, I, uh, when I'm coming up with a composition of painting, uh, I'm first looking for that uh, close to the rule of thirds 
proportion or arrangement. You will notice a lot of times, a lot of, I've noticed that, that a lot of my paintings, especially ones that are, will have rivers, will have that um, kind of a, a two-thirds, one-third proportion. What's interesting is that is very close to this proportion, very close. It's not the same. This is a little bit, um, a little bit more fine-tuned, you might call it. Uh, but it feels very, very, very much the same. So, but uh, usually when I'm composing, I'm looking for the larger, the largest shapes, the largest spaces versus the smaller. I'm I, I usually I'm composing first of all in terms of very large shapes, and the, and as you know, those of you who work with me closely know that I always compose with lights and shadows, the the, the pattern of lights and patterns of shadows. And so I, I'm looking for that relationship of uh, one third to two thirds to begin with. But I find that when I am uh, when I'm creating those shapes, I'm often drawn to or, or checking the uh, with, according to the golden section. I'm checking shape relationships, spacing and shape relationships according to golden shapes. So I'm using both. Uh, and I'm using both very loosely. Um, let's see. Okay, the rule of thirds. Oh, they're going both of them. Both. They both. They both serve a purpose. It's like you know, like like uh, any tool you work with. We have scissors that cut, that do one thing, and we have knives that do another. They both cut, but they work in different ways. And the same thing is true with these two tools. They're just tools. They're just guides and tools for helping us fine tune what we uh, intuitively already know how to do. Uh, we were born, we were born with that intuitive, or we wouldn't be able to recognize it. We were born with that intuitive feeling of, of per, we, I, I hate, I hesitate to use the word per, perfect, but the word perfect comes in as close to a perfect balance as, uh, as a human can experience. We are born with that feeling. And we recognize it. When we recognize it, we might not know what to call it, but we were drawn to it. And so when we, when we'll recognize it in a painting. Uh, you know, sometimes people are drawn to a painting because of some sentimental reason or because it's pretty, <laughs> because it hangs pretty over my fireplace or goes with my furniture. I don't care for those kinds of decisions. But anyway, <laughs> it gets off the subject, doesn't it? Uh, uh, so so not it's not one or the other but it's both which is why I wanted to include both in this discussion okay let's see so uh, have you heard of any other ratios such as pi or do you mean phi being used phi and uh, golden mean are the same thing the, the uh, uh, pi or phi some say phi some say pi was what the Greeks called the golden ratio and you'll find that a number of the proportional terms refer right back to the golden ratio and the uh, golden ratio or the golden section uh, or the Fibonacci numbers. And you also find that um, a lot of the systems, a lot of the composing systems, such as the um, um, uh, dynamics, so, oh, yeah, what is that? I've forgotten the term now. A lot of the composing systems that use grids are uh, they also call armatures. You've heard of the use of armatures for using composers. All those are built on the same principles, the same ratios as the Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio. They're, they're all related. Uh, and so uh, even, even the, uh, you know, another one I love to work with sometimes when a, a subject, um, when the subject presents itself to me, is the rebotment. I've done a quick tip on rebotment. Uh, that, and the rebotment is built on the golden ratio. Rebotment is that it is, is using the section of the golden ratio where the square in the golden ratio includes one portion of a painting, and then the, the rectangle of the golden ratio is used as another portion of the painting. And artists will use that in various ways. One of my favorites is uh, one by the watercolor painter Mary White. I can't remember the name of it now. Oh, is it Awakening or something? It's uh, obviously a woman 
it's representing a woman who is transitioning from uh, out of the physical life to the beyond, and and she has the 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 woman herself is like right on that square edge of the rebotment. Uh, there's a number of ways artists use these things, but they all are related. They all go right back to that golden uh, section, that golden ratio. Uh, and let's see, Jane, uh, jo Joni, sorry, Joni, can't read. Uh, yes, with regard to that ratio of spacing, there has to be a higher power. Yeah, where there are no answers, yep. And the interesting thing, too, about the Fibonacci numbers, that they go on infinitely. As if you're, if you're uh, creating the, uh, when you're creating from the rectangle, the golden rectangle I was showing you there in the video, where there's a square and then there's a rectangle and that rect within that rectangle you have another square another rectangle the same proportion that that can be subdivided and if there were enough space in there and they there are would if you have like micro micro whatever's you know if you used uh, uh, microscopes and things like that you could keep subdividing subdividing we the, we can't see it anymore but it still can go on to infinity and that's something we humans can't con quite comprehend, at least most of us can't quite comprehend. Um, so it is fascinating stuff and anything that relates to uh, things that get, um, you know, have a relationship that just keep causing us to ask questions, I find totally fascinating and I guess uh, I hope you don't get bored with it because <laughs> To me, that's why painting, why art is such a fascinating field. It's not just copying images. I mean, that would be boring. If I, if, I, if that's all there was to it, I wouldn't do it. That would just bore me stiff if I was just copying images. But it's how we can take those images and we can then in, reinterpret those images into our own expression in so many different ways, There's so many different options for what we can do with it. And I just get so excited about that kind of thing um, that I want you to be excited about it too, I guess. Anyway, so, oh my goodness, we're running out of time. Roger? Oh. Got some thank yous in there. Oh, some thank yous. Okay, great. Absolutely amazing. Joni, Belinda, fantastic. Well, I hope that you, oh, I'm going to show you one other thing before we sign off because I did bring another little toy with me. I find this book totally fascinating. And if you want to investigate further, all the implications are at least open up ideas for you for all the implications of what the golden section, the golden ratio, and the Fibonacci numbers can lead to. This little book, it was written way back. Oh gosh, when was it written? I don't even know, but I found it, I think I found it on Amazon, and I just absolutely am fascinated. It was, well, okay, it's been, it was, oh, it wasn't written that far back. What was it originally published? Uh, yeah, it was just published in 2006. Well, I know, when did I think it was written? It, anyway, it's called The Golden Section by Scott Olson. Uh, and I'll show it to you right here, The Golden Section. It's got uh, every, uh, it's got all the, well, it's got, I wouldn't say all that, but a number of the ways that the golden section in our universe works. That, the How it works with the Fibonacci numbers, how it works with the, uh, with plants, how it works with the planetary system, how it works with human, but it's really fascinating and it, it's really easy to read. Uh, every, uh, in fact, it, it's just uh, like uh, James Gurney's book, uh, one, one double page covers one topic. And I like that because it makes it easy. It makes it easier to understand. So it's kind of divided like that, if you can see. Anyway, I will, if this is, this would be great. A great thing. It's not very expensive, so if you really want to pursue the whole concept of the golden section, I recommend this above everything else. Uh, it, get, it has in it, I think, anything that you'd need. So ha have fun investigating the uh, the golden section, uh, golden mean, the golden ratio. Have fun investigating that. And okay, I'm getting some comments, and I need to recognize you people when you, because you say you say stuff, and I forget to. Answer back. Thank you so much. Belinda, Johnny, Bridget, Mary Ellen, Terry, Victoria, Malia, Sue, uh, and that's just a few. Thank you. You're all sending thanks and you're quite welcome. Thank you for joining us. This has been a fascinating discussion and I hope it leads you 
to further discovery and investigation in this whole wonderful thing that we call visual art. So that's it for now. Thanks again. Uh, we we'll hope to see you next month. That will be in April, the third Sunday in April. Hope to see you again then. We'll fascinate and we will discuss another fascinating topic. Okay, that's it. Bye bye for now.